Hello everyone and welcome back to another book review. Today I am going to be reviewing Fukushima, the story of a nuclear disaster. This is what the cover looks like and this is by David Lockbaum, Edwin Lyman, and Susan Q. Stranahan and the Union of Concerned Scientists. So this is what the cover looks like. I'm going to be discussing the contents of this book as well as my thoughts on the book overall and how well it accomplished what I was looking for the book to provide. So on March 11, 2011, for those of you who don't know or don't remember, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant suffered a disaster. This was caused by a earthquake followed by a tsunami that was caused by the earthquake that exceeded the design standards for the nuclear power plant. So this led to the earthquake followed by the tsunami had a lot of damage. It was a very damaging earthquake tsunami combination and it led to an electrical blackout and also destroyed a lot of the extra cooling equipment around the power plant. So in a nuclear power plant, and I want to make a little note here, I'm not a nuclear scientist, of course, so if there are any errors that's entirely on my fault and not the book, but my understanding is that in a nuclear power plant the fuel rods, which are creating the energy through boiling water or steam or whatever process it's being used to create energy, are very hot and they're intentionally meant to be hot, but they don't just cool down immediately when the power gets turned off because it's nuclear, it needs to be kept cool. So when you have something like a blackout, the, there needs to be processes in place to keep the fuel cool to prevent things from melting down or from leading to an explosion. What happened in Fukushima is due to the electrical grid blackout and then also the destruction of other things that may cause cooling, there wasn't enough power, batteries, cooling systems in place to keep the fuel, including the spent fuel pool, the, all that fuel cool. There wasn't enough to keep all of that under the right temperature and instead we had a meltdown and a nuclear disaster. This led to a uh, release of radiation into the environment which has very bad consequences for humans if you get too much of it. So there was a massive disaster and the nation of Japan had to respond and had to figure out what they were going to do to mitigate this disaster. Um, this book discusses that. So the very beginning of that is a discussion on what actually happened. It's how how this disaster took place and how things went down during the disaster. But there's a heavy emphasis on this book as well on how governments responded to the disaster, particularly the Japanese government. Of course, it happened in their nation, but also in the United States because the United States had a lot of reactors of a similar nature to the one that went wrong in, well, things that went wrong in Japan. So they have to make sure that that sort of scenario couldn't happen in the United States, or if they had reactors that were at risk the same way that the one in Japan had been at risk in this manner, what could they do to prevent this? And that is what the authors are discussing, both how this went wrong, and then primarily I would say two thirds of the book is government response to what went wrong at Fukushima. So, the government response, as mentioned, goes between the Japanese government response and the US government response. Japan, of course, especially initially following the disaster, has to deal with keeping people calm. They don't want their citizens to panic and they also are, in a sense, I would say morally responsible for, for providing needed information to the public. However, they don't want to appear out of control of the situation, so they're going to have to kind of play this carefully. If they say, whoops, we messed up, nuclear power isn't something you don't just want to whoops and mess up. There's serious consequences and it can render places uninhabitable if not managed correctly for a number of years. We see that with the thing that I'm going to compare frequently, Chernobyl. I'm going to bring it up just because, thankfully, we don't have a lot of nuclear disasters to compare this to, so there is going to be some comparisons, even though I know that's not exactly a one-to-one -one comparison of what went wrong in the disaster. Japan doesn't want to feel out of control, but they also, they also want to, in my opinion, reading this, they want to control the narrative, they want to seem in control, they don't want their citizens to panic, but this led, leads to some problems which cropped up again when um, reading about Chernobyl, and that is withholding necessary information. Um, page 109 in the book has a paragraph that could come right out of a book from uh, Chernobyl. I think it kind of sums up the situation well. In an effort to avoid arousing fears, the government also deliberately withheld crucial information a fact that confirmed the suspicions and inflamed the distrust of many when the omissions came to light. That could just apply to anything the government withholds information about that is then discovered to be relevant to the situation. Um, so 
as they slowly release information, the people become more, they want to have answers and they want to know exactly how safe they are. This is compounded by the US's um, problems both initially and then long term. So Japan had this initial problem of wanting to control the situation, keep their citizens safe, of course, but also not appear out of control or cause panic. And also the long term issue in Japan was going to be whether or not nuclear power would continue within the nation following this meltdown. The US government also had some problems to deal with both, both initially and long term. First of all, the government needs to determine whether or not their citizens are safe in Japan. So they have citizens living in Japan as well, and they need to make sure that they're conveying correct information regarding safety and travel to their citizens in their in Japan. And especially when the initial information comes out, Japan has put out an, ex uh, an evacuation zone that I believe was 10 or 12 miles. And that's where they told their citizens they needed to evacuate. The US looking at the same modeling, the same weather, wants to evacuate citizens up to 50 miles. But to come out and say that is going to make Japan feel they don't want to make their ally look bad on an international or global stage but the u.s of course has its first loyalty to making sure their citizens are safe but they don't want to spoil this relationship with their ally and eventually they do have to make the call where they want their citizens to evacuate from a 50 mile radius which is different from what the japanese government says so then of course it also creates the suspicion of another government is telling their people to be more careful than our government is and this reminded me again of the little series i don't know if it was hbo that did that chernobyl series way back in 2019 2020 i did watch that one and there's a scene and i'm going to be quoting again from five-year-old memory so bear with me where they say like our government saying things are fine but they won't let kids play outside in germany and this is happening inside the soviet union basically our government's telling us everything's fine but another another government isn't it has a higher standard of safety that they're holding their people to and I think that kind of mirrored very well where then the Japanese people are like, well, why do they have a different exclusion zone or why do they have a different evacuation zone? And is this truly safe? And then Japan, of course, looks like they don't really know what they're doing on an international stage. Long term, the U.S. has to look at their own reactors. And this is these were boiling water reactors. And they had some of the exact same reactors in the United States. And they had to say, do these look do these lay on fault lines? And do we want to do anything about this or do we want to bow to industry pressure to not beef up security because the security is already safe. So there is kind of a push and pull about that um, in the United States and that's the long-term implications and all nuclear power plants, whether they're located in Japan or the US or anywhere else in the world needs to determine, well, what are they going to do with um, their nuclear power plants to make, make sure they're safe in the case of inclement weather or uh, earthquake or some other natural disaster. Now my thoughts about this book overall as a book. So this year, I think I'm really gonna be hammering in my book reviews the titles of books because frequently I find when I'm slightly disappointed by a book or it's not really that I'm disappointed by the book itself, it's that the title didn't match my expectations. I have expectations about the book, or not just the title, the book didn't match my expectations. So I have expectations on a book and then the book doesn't deliver on those expectations that I've been led to believe to get out of this book. So when I look at this, it says Fukushima, the story of a nuclear disaster. I think it's going to be about the disaster itself, maybe an hour by hour breakdown of what went wrong. And mentally, and maybe again, I shouldn't be doing this because they are two different books. I'm comparing this to the audiobook that that I listened to Midnight at Chernobyl by Adam Higginbottom. The review, for the, the review for that, I believe, is on my channel as well, um, which is kind of a breakdown of what happened at Chernobyl and the government response to it and the international response to it. This book, I feel like, should have just been called like the Fukushima disaster and the U.S. regulatory response to the Fukushima disaster because there was a very equal emphasis on the U.S. government's response and internal U.S. agencies fighting with regulators and nuclear industry in the U.S. in the aftermath of Fukushima which is fine, which is in itself an interesting question. But when I got this book out, I was hoping for a more heavy emphasis on the Japanese side of the whole situation because that's where this took place. Now, if I had gotten this out and the title had clearly said there was going to be also an equal emphasis on the US regulatory side of the situation, then I could have expected that and moderated my expectations accordingly. I feel like the title was not misleading because it, was a, it wasn't like I opened this book on Fukushima and got a book on the Three Mile Island incident. It was about Fukushima, but it could have been more honed in or the title could have more clearly explained that there was also going to be a heavy emphasis on the U.S. Now, this is written with cooperation or through the Union of Concerned Scientists. So, of course, knowing the stance 
of the book's authors is very important. I find that anytime I read a book about nuclear power, especially regarding disasters, there is of course a stance that people are taking. People tend to be very pro nuclear energy or they're very against, they think we shouldn't use it at all. People have these stances and knowing the stance of the person who wrote the book that you're about to read, whether or not it agrees with your personal stance, if you have a personal stance, um, it's just, I think, important to know just so you know how they're going to draw conclusions or maybe why they're looking at a situation from a certain way. When I did my little bit of research, it does seem like the Union of Concerned Scientists isn't against nuclear power overall. They don't seem to be anti-nuclear power. They do seem to be in favor of stronger regulations on the industry and making sure things are very safe. They seem to have concerns about the safety of these nuclear reactors. So that is my understanding of the position of the authors of this book. So they're not writing from an anti nuclear perspective, but they are writing from a perspective of scientists who want additional regulation on the industry. Something else that I feel like just goes hand in hand, this was inspired by a photo collection I read, looked through called Fukushima. That one's on my channel. It's a, me holding a book with, uh, I believe there's cherry blossoms on the cover. And that was a photo collection from the exclusion zone taken in 2016. And something that was really clear that I felt like the photos conveyed was the interruption of childhood that occurs when you have a disaster like this. So due to the, the tsunami and the earthquake would have already disrupted people's lives anyways, but with this nuclear dis disaster, there are areas that at least it, as of 2016, when the photography collection was put out, couldn't return to normal. There are people who were still excluded. And excluded makes it sound harsh, but there was an exclusion zone they couldn't return to. And when you see pictures of like a falling apart school gymnasium and or students' classrooms where you can see like assignments written on the board or things that were clearly expected to happen on calendars and dates following March 11th, then you get the clear sense that there was like childhood interrupted, which I feel like is, I don't know, I don't want to pit like adults' lives interrupted as being less bad from a child's life interrupted, but I feel like it's particularly hard to see seeing that there was kids who were just taken out of a school day one day and things have not gone back to normal for them. And I feel like that was also made clear in this book and I did appreciate that. They talk about how the opening of Japan's school day actually occurred uh, the, the new school year in Japan occurred sh on April 1st, I believe it was. So shortly after the incident occurred and Japan was trying to keep some normal life going in that. They tried to get kids back into schools and going normally. But you understand that those kids were supposed to be going back to a school that I saw in that Fukushima photo collection. Um, but they weren't going to be going back there. And I'm sure for many of the schools, they were just too destroyed. Um, the kids who would have attended have now since graduated high school. So that was kind of a thing that a through line from that Fukushima photo collection to Fukushima, the story of a nuclear disaster. This was overall an acceptable read. I'm going to say that it, it conveyed the information. It was clear. I understood what was happening. I felt like knowing the author's bias going in that they weren't against nuclear energy, but they um, wanted stronger regulations. I, I felt like the information was conveyed accurately and not very sensationalized. I do think that I wish the title had been different. And due to that, I maybe had different expectations for the book overall. I would have liked that to be a little bit more clear. It was a good execution of the topic. I'm not sure if it was the best execution of the topic. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't think you will have a bad time. In fact, I think this may be a good place to start, but I don't know if this was the best way for this topic to be executed. Again, I felt like through the entire time I was comparing it to that Midnight at Chernobyl by Adam Higginbottom that I listened to, and maybe it's unfair for me to compare those two things, but Hopefully we don't need to have a lot of books on nuclear disasters, so hopefully there aren't a lot of books for me to compare this to in the future. But I do feel like there's still a little bit of room for improvement from this book, so I feel like this could be a little tricky because my library doesn't have a lot of other books on Fukushima, like this particular nuclear disaster, so I may need to order from other libraries if I want to read more and compare. So I'm not sure if there has been a better account written, but I do feel like there's room for improvement from this book. However, this is not, in my opinion, a bad book. It is an acceptable book, but again, it's a book that leaves room for improvement for future authors looking to expand on this topic, especially as we get several years removed from the incident. I feel like the further away we get from the incident, maybe more perspective can be applied and see how things actually played out. Maybe that's why that book on Chernobyl was so much better because we've had 20, 30, 40 years. When was that in the eighties? I think we've had a number of years since that incident to really retro, uh, like to look back in hindsight and see everything that maybe could have been done or how things were done or information has come to light. So maybe time is what's needed to write a good book on this. I'm not sure this was an acceptable execution, but I still think there's room for improvement. If you read Fukushima by the Union of Concerned Scientists, 
please let me know what you thought about this book. Please let me know if you thought it was a good execution, if you had some trouble with the uh, focus of the book like I did, or if you really like the focus on the US regulatory industry, please let me know. I would love to hear it. I would love to get your book recommendations, whether or not they're on Fukushima and nuclear power or not. I would love to receive recommendations and I try to read all the ones you recommend. So please leave your comments in the comment section below. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day.